that's a really, I'm, I'm excited to be here. So thank you for the invitation. And, and I think a lot of that comes from one of the first seed companies that I met when I went to, I just attended a meeting in St. Cloud just to learn about agriculture in this region. When I first started was, was an Albert Lead C rep. And so it was really nice to see the information they had to offer. And I learned a lot from his presentation. And since then, we've been partnering on a lot of things between um, sponsorships at our like conservation tillage conference or the Midwest cover crops meeting when that was in Fargo this past March. So it's been a really nice partnership. So I'm glad to be here. Um, but what Mac asked me to talk about is cover crops in a corn soybean rotation. And I was excited because I like talking about cover crops where sometimes where the rotation doesn't include wheat. Because as much as we hear about getting our foothold in cover crops after a wheat crop, I actually prefer to start using cover crops in a corn part of the rotation and then rotate through there. So this will be fun. So my biggest thing with cover crops, and we talked a little bit about this last night at dinner, is that they're very goal specific, right? So sometimes I'll get a call from a farmer and he'll say, I really want to use cover crops to build soil health. And that is such a tough goal to meet. Has anyone tried measuring soil health in this room? The underwear deal. The underwear deal. Okay, so that makes it not as hard to measure soil health because you can really see it. But as, have people been doing the Haney test, the Solvita test, the Cornell soil health test? Um, there are a lot of tests out there that you can get results from, but they're not really calibrated for our region. So when we talk about trying to build soil health, it's really hard to use those soil health scores that you get to, to measure anything in our soils. Um, so it's tough to meet that goal. When you say I want to build soil health, it's very difficult to meet that goal. Um, I think we were talking about you guys get some calls to the seed company that say I want to just start using this cover crop stuff. Um, that's a tough way to, to get into cover crops because we don't know what you want to achieve. So I think the, the important thing, and hopefully you'll walk away with some of this information today, are some of the questions that you need to ask when you're getting into cover crops if you're not already. But I'm guessing, are most of you into cover crops and already using them on your farms? Show of hands. So, Okay, so most people are using cover crops. Um, if you're thinking about getting into them, there's some really good questions that you can be asking so that you get the right mix to achieve the right goals on your farm. Um, and oftentimes when I work with farmers, their goals are specific for every single different field. So they're not, pos they're not using the same recipe on every, every field. They're using different recipes on different fields based on soil texture, based on conditions, based on what they know about the field, the rotation they have on that field. Um, so we need to keep it really specific and goal oriented. Um, so one of the top goals that we have is reducing erosion. Um, so I do a lot of work in the Red River Valley, a lot of beet farmers, um, but erosion is just everywhere, right? Your soils are the number one thing, your number one investment on your farm are prob is probably the land. Does anyone have a different investment that you think is higher? It's probably the land, right? So I don't know a single farmer that enjoys seeing his soil blow away, right? We see that investment blowing away, we see all the nutrients. When we measure nutrients in the soil, we measure that top six inches, right? That's where we measure everything. We don't care about the six to 24. We measure it to look for nitrogen, but we care about that zero to six. So we need to keep it in place and reduce erosion. So this is a field that, um, that I work with closely, where you can see the, the corn was or, uh, the corn stalks left standing. There's a cover crop that had been interceded and is underlying it, controlling erosion. Um, some people like to build aggregation and get some biological activity going. So we hear all this about the soil biology, right? Well, soil biology, like, they do like to be fed. I mean, a lot of these terms I don't use a lot in my talks, but soil biology are very important. They cycle those nutrients in our soils. They release it for the crops to take up. They help us reduce our fertilizer inputs. The biology really work for us in a good year when conditions are favorable. Um, but building aggregation is my favorite thing on Earth. I worked with aggregates and measured them in a lab for 15 years. So I have a lot of experience looking at aggregates. And they're one of the best indicators of soil health because they're easy to see. You can take a shovel in the field, put it in the soil, pop it up and look at the aggregation. Has anybody done that? Yeah, it's great, isn't it? You can learn a lot. <clears throat> So my tip is when you, when you do that, when you're looking at soils in your field, look at it on the shovel, go find a different field and a different management, look at the soils there and see what's different. You don't know a whole lot unless you see the comparison. So that's a really great way to look, look for your changes in soil. But building aggregation is an excellent, excellent thing to do in soils. Um, manage compaction. So here's that tillage radish that's pushing through that soil with a lot of force, opening up those channels for roots to grow down. So there was some work in, in Maryland by Ray Weil, who's kind of the godfather of soil science. He wrote the book that everybody has to read when they get a soil science degree. 
And he found that roots of, of soybean actually follow radish channels better than they follow anything like cereal rye or other grass crops. So those radish roots are really important for breaking through that soil, getting rid of sun compaction, giving the other root channels from the crop a path to follow. And managing water in the spring, is that a big issue for a lot of you? Spring moisture? Yeah, okay, we, we run into that a lot in North Dakota because everything is so cold, cold all the time, wet in the spring. Um, <clears throat> it's a tough spring, but this is one way to manage moisture. So this, these, these are fields down in the southeast corner. So they are in Fargo clays. This is some of the worst soil that I work with. It's like 60% clay, drainage very, poor. Um, this field has been prevent plant more times than it's been in crops. Uh, but these fields side by side, so this one over here is actually tile drained and it has water building up on it, corn soybean rotation on that one, um, deep ripping, heavy tillage. And this one is in its third year of no-till at this point. It has cereal rice seeded on it about 60, well no, this farmer does more like 80 pounds now. He's, I think they did 120 pounds this year this fall, so they're up there in their seeding rates, but they have high clay soils, they need to use the moisture. Most farmers are probably around 30 or 40 in my region for, for seeding rates. But he's got cereal rye on there, transpiring moisture, so getting rid of it through transpiration. He's got it going down the root channels of that rye crop, that rye cover crop, to get the water to infiltrate into the soil. He's got some evaporation occurring there because it's not full coverage. So he's got three modes of action that he's moving water on that field versus that other one that has tile drainage. Well, that water can't even get to the tile. It's so compacted. And he's got evaporation. That's what he's relying on. So in April, is it warm enough to really evaporate that much? Not North Dakota. Maybe it is here. You guys are way warmer down here, aren't you? North Dakota's. <laughs> so just stacking your tools. It's this idea. I want to manage water in the spring. I'm going to stack my tools and give myself the best possible chance to, to manage that moisture. Um, increasing trafficability at planting. Here's planting soybean into a living cereal rise. Anybody do that? I tried that, a few of you. Did you love it? Fall seeded rye. Uh, so the question is, is this fall or, or spring seeded rye, and if they're gonna roll it down or they're gonna come in and chop it, or in this case, uh, it was fall seeded rye, probably about 60 pounds, um, planting into it with soybean. That same day, they spray it out. Um, so they use a full rate of herbicide and get rid of it. Um, but they don't, in these heavy clay soils, they don't spray it out in advance because I think a lot of times they feel like they have enough moisture to be able to do that. On a sandier soil, you better be checking that every single time that you go by that field and make sure it's not using too much moisture. Because anyone's experience with rye uses a ton of water, right? Once it really gets cranking, that seed bed can get dry really quick. So always watch your fields and lower the rates, adjust the rates. If you're gonna be looking at a sandier soil, use lower rates, a higher clay soil, use higher rates. But customize that and make it, make it work for your field. Um, improving trafficability at harvest. This is, okay, so this is a day, I was out, do you guys, is Ag Week show down here? Ag Week television, okay. So I was out filming with Ag Week, we were doing a soil your undies thing, which I'm so glad that, where is he, that, that you cover the undies thing, because I don't have to talk about it. I got, yeah, that's a whole nother story. But, um, <clears throat> but this is a field, we are out filming something about soil your undies. Um, this farmer called me and he said, you gotta come see this. And he had harvested his soybean on this field at the same time this guy was harvesting on his field. So both soybean crops, both harvesting at the same time. Um, we drove out there, I saw the pilot that flies on all our cover crops fly over, called him, I said, Eric, I need an aerial shot. And this is what he took. So the difference in these fields, okay, so this is, like I said, no-till, this is probably the fourth or fifth year on it. Cover crops in every part of that rotation on that field. It's been barley, it's been sunflowers, it's been soybean. Uh, we have yet to have corn out there, but this has had cover crops in every part of the rotation. And this field is deep ripped, chisel plowed, corn bean rotation, no cover crops. Okay, so he harvested this field in a two-wheel drive, and two-wheel drive in his combine. He had tracks, and you can see where he's slipping all over the place, right? They loaded all their, all their uh, semis on the field. This guy was loading on the road. So really, I thought that was pretty cool to see that. And then this is up close. So now you can really see how, how tough that harvest was um, on that field because there was no structure in it. There was no structure to hold up that equipment even though it had tracks. 
I couldn't walk in that field. I, I lost my boot practically in it. But the other one, look how smooth that is and how nice it is because that structure is built. The moisture has been managed using cover crops and using crop rotation. Um, it's really improved that field quite a bit in a very short period of time. So where do we start? Where do we start? I told you my favorite place is in, in corn, right? <clears throat> I think that's a great place to start. Everybody here grows corn. So let's talk a little bit about how to get these cover crops in rotation. Um, so these were three fields. I, I put a wheat one in there because I want to show you the size of the cover crops on that wheat field. But here's cover crops after wheat. This is all the same mix. Cover crops after wheat, flowing on into soybean, and interseeded into corn. And so if you look at the size of those cover crops across the top, uh, those ones on the left are from, I suppose my shadow's not pointing at it, are, from, are in the wheat field. Here they are in the soybean field, and here they are in the interseeded corn. And look how close in size the interseeded corn and the wheat cover crops are. Yep. Okay, yeah, so the, the inner seed of corn is flowing on, the wheat was drilled, and the, the soybean was flowing on. So it's going to be a little bit different in the time, right? But we put the, based on time that we could get it in there, um, inner seed of corn would have been probably around tasseling. Okay, so it's going to be a little bit later. Um, but all that growth on that cover crop in corn is suppressed, right? But we still got an amazing amount of growth when we inner seed it into corn versus what we had after wheat. So I think when I see that, I think, gosh, we don't need to have wheat in rotation to use cover crops, do we? If we can get that much growth and I'm that far north, I mean, you guys are like Hawaii probably compared to Fargo, right? I mean, not today maybe, but. <laughs> uh, population on the corn, and that's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but 30 inch row spacing. Um, he was probably around like 90, low 90s on his day length. So we're not gonna have as long of corn varieties as you will, but, but the 30 inch row spacing is consistent, right? You guys all are mostly 30 in your spacing. And the soybean up there, this field is on 15s. But pretty amazing establishment. So when we interseed corn, there are multiple ways to do it, right? Has anybody played around with building your own equipment to interseed on any fields? We work with a couple uh, producers that use the inner seeder, the Hineker. It's a 12 row. It's got two discs, uh, 15, 15 inches on center. So it's two in between 30s. V7, V8. Okay, so that's inner seeding, drilling it into the ground, right? So, so getting really good seed to soil contact and getting established. So that's, so that's a, g a great way to do it. That's actually my preferred method now after trying all these different ways to actually get that seed to soil contact is really beneficial. Is anybody else trying anything else? We're, we work with a couple of customers that use an inner seeder, and it's um, a Hineker set up with a, what is it, a 500 bush or a 500 pound box on it that, and has two, two coulters that go in between each 30 inch roll. There's a guy down here at Albert Lee or somewhere in the Albert Lee area, and Andy something, I don't know his last name. I've met him at some of the cover crop meetings, though, and he's doing the drop tubes on a Hagee High Boy into corn. And he can go in pretty much any stage you want, I guess. Quite a few guys around here. Tom Cotter, everybody's familiar with. He's been doing some of that. And he goes all the way north from all the way down here. I think he's maybe over by Blue Earth, even, is where... He's, he originates from, but he gets all the way up to Olmstead County, like by Rochester. So there was quite a few guys up there that did some work with him this year too. So yeah, and that's a really efficient way to cover a lot of acres, right? I mean, if you're if you need that flexibility to get into corn what, at whatever stage, um, and you want to cover a lot of acres, that high boy is a really good way to do that. Um, you don't get as good a seed to soil contact, right, because you're still just dropping it on the surface, but you're a little bit better than airplane because you're dropping it between the rows. So that's a good approach to use too. We've used them all. Um, so first, here's the, the, the seeding that we've been doing. We have a, well, it's by Amity, but it's not on the market. It's a Fargo Air um, twin row uh, seeder, kind of like their soybean special. If anybody has an Amity piece of equipment, it's like their soybean special. Um, so they, we went in and we, we seeded between the rows at this, this was like the first year this field is going to no-till. Um, so you can see that there's still a lot of surface exposed. Uh, we went in between V5 and 8, 
Um, our tractor clearance was 18 inches, so once the corn was over 18, that was it, right? We were done for the season, we couldn't intercede anymore. So that's one limitation of doing this, is that you, can, you have a, a certain time limit where you can get in and actually intercede. But you get really good seed to soil contact. And it was very, very dry when we did it. <clears throat> so I'm actually happy that we had that seed to soil contact because it was so dry. Um, there's the equipment we use. Um, we've used it for a couple years. NDSU owns that unit. Um, so it takes us a lot of time to do all of our plots, but, but we have it. Um, here's at the time of seeding going in. You can actually see, I mean, look how dry it was. This was 2016. So it was really, the, all the corn leaves were curled. It was very, very dry. But we somehow got a good catch. So here's mid-season, that twin row, uh, 40 pounds of cereal rye. I threw in five pounds of radish, which was way too much, but I don't know. I did it. I'm still learning. Um, and here, so there's between row, mid-season, and here, if you can kind of see, this is where we had a skip in the corn. Um, so you can see where the, the cover crops are fairly large out here, but they're all that size within the corn rows. So if anyone's concerned about cover crops competing with their corn, I don't think you need to worry about it if you're going in after that corn is established after five leaf. Do we push the envelope and go in a little earlier? We have, and we haven't been hurt by it, but that was this year we went in at three or four leaf, and the corn grew so fast that I don't think anybody, you could probably seed it at any time and been okay. But on a year where the corn doesn't grow as fast, you're gonna get burned. So five to eight leaf is our recommendation for our area and that's on 30 inch row spacing. Uh, post harvest, this looks great. This is a farmer that, uh, this is his only field that he's doing no-till on. And he called me and said, Abby, I did what you said, I left the stock stand. So does everybody have chopping heads probably? If you have the ability to turn off a chopping head when you're using cover crops and interseeding them, that's a really good thing to do. Um, you keep all the residue off the ground, especially if you're converting to no-till. Um, you keep the residue off the ground. You can uh, capture some snow in there to insulate those cover crops a little over winter. You keep the residue in place, keep it from blowing all over the field. Um, so that's a nice approach to use. Standing stalks, cutting as high as you can. Um, that seems to work really well for, for the farmers I work with. But that cover crop really establishes nicely. When the corn dries down, it gives it that sunlight to get going. It's already there, it's in place, it can do its thing. Um, so here's another picture of that interseeded radish versus the radish outside. I had to work so hard to get that big radish. I mean, look how dig I, I had to dig deep. I was sweating. But the, you know, the interseeded radish, I mean, that's not competing with anything. But you have the big radish outside. You have the big radish establishing where you could have water hemp or kochia or any skips in the field. Nobody has a perfect field. So any field where you have a skip in the corn, you're going to get that cover crop established and growing. It's gonna compete with the weeds, it's gonna use up some of the nutrients, it's a good thing. Especially when we, when we don't have a lot of herbicides at work anymore, right? We need to think of other modes of action to control weeds in our fields. Um, so this is going into winter, there's the size of the radish. Um, I thought it looked great, it was nice and insulated, so you can see it's still green. So that, I really like the interseeding with that unit. Um, I also work with a farmer who does broadcasting, and he's in the Jamestown area, so a little bit sandier soils in the valley, um, but there's still 90-some day corn, 30-inch row spacing. He's been no-till for about 14 years. Um, he bought this piece of equipment that has, I think has two boxes on it, so he can spread his, he can side dress, and he can also spread rye at the same time. So he's in there early, because he's side dressing early, he's getting his nitrogen down, he's getting his rye seed down, and it works pretty well for me to cover a lot of acres, do a lot of custom work that way. And he had questions about rates and what he should be doing. So on the left-hand side is 30 pound rate, and on the right is 60. So this field this, that year had gotten hail twice. So the canopy was opened up, the rye established really well, and the rye established instead of all the weed pressure he could have had. So he was really pleased with this. And between the 30 and 60, I mean, that's quite a bit of biomass difference. So then he got into the idea, well, why don't I variable rate my cover crops? He's got variable soils, right? You have sandy soils on the top, higher clay soils on the bottom. You have different management issues. You need to conserve moisture on the top and keep it from eroding, but you need to use moisture in the lower spots and be able to get good access. So here's what he did. He did, on the hilltops, he did 10 pounds of rye broadcast, and he didn't make a map or anything for it. He just flipped the switch as he was going through. Um, so that's his 10 pound rate, and then here's his 60 pound rate in the lower part of the field. Um, and I think that looks great. What a way to make cover crops work even better 
with a really simple thing, just knowing your field and knowing the topography and adjusting on the fly. So that's a good, good approach. Um, so he's been pretty happy with that. And then there's this other high boy drop between the rows. We did quite a bit of that um, across the southern part of the state, again, on 30-inch row spacing. And Hagee has this piece of equipment. I think they still do in Breckenridge, Minnesota. Um, it hasn't sold because I don't think it has, it has one box on it, so you can't do two things at once. And I think that's the one problem with this, is that you can't drop fertilizer, you can't do fertilizer, you can't do, I suppose at this stage, later in the season, you wouldn't do fertilizer anyways, but, um, but it's still sitting there, which is unfortunate because it's a really good tool and you can go quickly across a lot of acres. Um, so this is shortly after dropping the seed. This is on a no-till field, so I think that residue really helps that seed when it's broadcast actually start coming up and, and germinating. Um, we had a field a mile away from this one that was conventional till and we dropped the cover crop on that, on that surface. It was too dry. It didn't have any residue there to help the seed germinate. So, um, so I think that residue helps a little bit. Um, here it is mid-season and then post-season, post-harvest. And this is again 40 pounds, 40 pounds of rye, five pounds of radish. So I think you could, your radish could probably be at about two. I don't think it needs to be at five. I was still kind of learning. Um, so this works pretty well. And then flying it on, that's probably the most common. Is most, have most people flown on rye? If you're using it, yeah. How was your, did you have pretty good luck with it? Yes, good. Did you get a, he has, he's had good luck. Did you get a rain right after you flew it on? Okay, so he got rain before he flew it on, but that rain that was there, that moisture helped it germinate, which is great news. Anyone else flying on and have experiences with it? Yeah. Okay, so he flew it on, the rye sat there for a while, you picked the corn, got, got some additional rain, and then the rye came up and did really well. And that's kind of the amazing thing about rye, isn't it? I mean, cereal rye, it's just you can, you can put it out there and it can kind of lay around for a little bit. And if it doesn't do anything that fall or the stand looks pretty bad and you're interceding, the next spring it's going to look a lot better. And so that's the, the nice thing about rye. So flying on is, 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 can be kind of hit or miss, and it makes you a little nervous if you're going to put all that, all that seed out there. And what rates were you guys at? Do you remember? Okay, we're, we're usually 40 pounds. Okay. Yeah, we're usually around like 60 or 70 is what we do when we fly it on, but 40 pounds I think would, I've seen good stands with 40 too. So it's, I suppose it depends on timing in the season and, and where, you're, where you're at. Um, so this is how the rye looks when you fly it on um, after one month and then April the following year. So this is really hard. The first year I started doing stuff with cover crops and I'd look at how that stand was one, after, one month after, after flying it on, I would just be so disappointed. So I was like, what a waste of money. And then you go out there in the April, you're like, okay, I feel really good now. That looks great. And the thing about too is that, so the rye, when you fly it on, it may not establish across the whole field, but it's probably gonna establish in the low parts of the field, right? So if it establishes in low parts, is that a failure, but not on the high parts? Does anyone see that as a failure? We're used to looking at even crops across our fields, right? But if it establishes in that low part where your equipment gets stuck and you rut it up and you mud things up, I would rather have it established there on the high, than on the high parts in the field that are sandier, where it's, it may be more prone to erosion, but you still have the residue there to protect it. Um, I'd rather have it established in the low part than the high part, and that's a win. Yes? Uh, so the question is, were we using cereal rye or annual rye that early in the season? And to be honest, I just use cereal rye and everything. So I know annual ryegrass is more shade tolerant, and it can do better in those situations. But for me, the thing that, the reason I use cereal rye and everything, regardless of its shade tolerance, is because I want it there the next spring. And up in the tundra, by the North Pole where Santa Claus and his workshop are, we don't have that luxury of annual ryegrass overwintering. It won't overwinter in our, in our area. So, um, so using the cereal rye is, is, is where we're at. Yeah, question. All right, so he makes a really good point about in your area because of the day length of corn and the shading that happens, that cereal rye going in early would not be a good choice. That annual rye grass would be a better choice early on in the season like that. So, um, and that's something we've seen a little bit on our plots where we do have cereal rye. We had some side by side this year where we had 95 and 90, 91 day corn. And the 95, our, our cover crops that were seeded at the same time as on the 91, um, they, they grew and they didn't establish very well. 
but on the 91, they establish great. And so it has something to do with the light that gets through and the architecture and the canopy. And I think um, somebody in Iowa was doing some work with Intercity and they say it just, they, they have a really hard time getting it to work because of the shading. So, and you're not gonna sacrifice bushels on your corn for cover crops, right? Nobody's gonna, please don't do that. Don't do that. Don't, don't sacrifice bushels for cover crops. Um, so that, that is a good point. It's something to consider, and that's where you kind of figure out what works best in your system and with different varieties and that kind of, as to how to make that work, work better. So um, um, I'm not sure what populations they're using. I, yeah, not being an agronomist, I'm not as in tune with some of that stuff. But I do know, speaking of that kind of thing, herbicide program is really important too when you're considering this. Residual of your herbicides is extremely important when you're using cover crops um, because you don't want to have a failure with that. So we have on our NDSU Soil Health webpage, we have um, a local consultant kind of went through and he picked some of the match matches for families and things like that for cover crops with some of the weeds out of our weed guide. And you can use that as kind of a, a guidance system for what herbicides might hurt some of your cover crops. But really consider that. But then on the same token, I've seen disasters where people pick their cover crops first and then their herbicide program. And you get really weedy fields that way. So pick your herbicide program first and make sure that's solid and as good as you can get it, then fit the cover crops into that system. So it's a big difference in doing it that way versus saying, I want to plant XYZ cover crop and I'm going to back off on this herbicide or I'm going to use a lower rate here. I'm going to make sure you have a solid program to control weeds and then fit this other mode of action in with it. So good point. I'm glad you asked that because it spurred a couple other thoughts. Um, let's see, so here's some aerial seeding, uh, one day before one inch rain, and then the day right after the one inch rain. So this guy wasn't as lucky as you where he had it kind of sit there and then get the rain later. Um, so we've seen that too where, where it's not, we don't get as good of a stand if we don't catch that rain right away. So being friends with the pilot is a really good thing and getting them there when you need it and actually putting some seed that you have on hand at the, at the airport is, is a good way to do it too because then you know that they're gonna switch over quick, get you done, and, and then go back to whatever else they need to be doing. So those relationships are important. I think we need to remember that as you get into cover crops, especially if you're gonna use it on a lot of acres, is to really form strong partnerships with some of these pilots that are doing this and get your seed there, get it available so that they can do it when they need to do it before it rains. Um, so we did some comparisons, just fiddling around in the field with um, seeding and then dropping it in between the rows. So we have our inner seeder here, um, going across the field in Lisbon, which is just west, south and west of Fargo. And these are the farmers that pulled together this piece of equipment behind us. So it's a, it's a Hagee side dress, and they put a, a box on the front. And I think on this, these guys always give me a hard time because I don't know equipment as well as I should, but they, they drop cover crop seed down here. They have a little bit of roughing it up to incorporate it here. They still want to put some baskets or something on the back to get better coverage. Um, but they're doing radish and turnips because their box is small, they still need to cover a lot of acres, they're dropping small seed on the surface. Um, and that's worked really well for them and they've, they've done a good job with their equipment modification. So modifying equipment is a really good thing to do. Use what you have, modify it with cheap fixes and try things out. Um, this is how it looked though between our stuff that we interseeded and had our twin row unit come in versus what they dropped on. So there's a big difference. They need to get a little more roughing up of that soil to get that coverage, to get the cover crop to establish better. And they know this. I mean, they, they tell me every time, they're like, oh, broadcasting, I hate broadcasting. We always do it, it never works. So, um, but it, it's, it's there and it'll still be a nice stand next spring. Um, here's some ideas from Rob Myers, who's gonna be here tomorrow. Um, he and I talked before this and he sent me some other pictures of, um, what is that, a spreader gandy box on the front of the combine. So just an idea where you can get cover crops spread. And then, what is this? A Salford vertical till unit where they put a box, a Valmar box so they can broadcast cover crops and then get a little bit of coverage with their vertical tillage. So I like that. I like seeing what farmers come up with because it's a lot of fun. You guys know your equipment better than anything. I didn't grow up on a farm. I don't know equipment. First time I was in a combine, I called it a tractor. That farmer will never let me live that down. <clears throat> uh, so that shading is a big deal. Um, I work some with 22s up there because of the sugar beets. Um, and we, we just don't get as good of a catch as we do on the 30. But now you're seeing stuff right on Twitter and social media about going to 60 inch row 
corn to get cover crops in. And I don't think that's a great idea either, but, but I think you need to be, so maybe your timing on when you go in will be, will be different on the, 20, on the 15 versus the 30. And so that would be something that, that you would maybe set up on farm and you just play around with it on 10 acres or something, you know, seed one strip at one time, seed the next strip at the next time, and, and then get kind of an idea for it. And then when all the weather changes the next year, you can start over and figure out what works next. That's like, I like every time I learn something, it changes the next year. But, um, but that's where, you know, kind of that customization, if you have some an idea of, okay, I, need, I can broadcast the seed between the rows, or I can drop it between the rows, but I need to have a little bit of coverage from the soil to get it going. So you're going to modify your equipment there, and then you can play around with the timing. Um, figure out what works best. And if you have residue on the surface or no, or no residue, that's going to make, gosh, so I were, I've been doing most of my work in the southeastern part of our state, and now I'm starting to work in the northeastern part. And so even farmers up there that are predominantly wheat, and we talk about, oh, you got all kinds of time after wheat to, to seed cover crops, they have to interseed their wheat because there's not enough time up there. I mean, they are literally like, I don't know what you, I don't know why I'm working up there. It's going to be challenging because it's so, so cold and they have such a short season, they have so much moisture. Um, so I think for us in North Dakota, seeding after corn probably isn't a possibility. Seeding after soybean is, um, so I have some farmers that do that. So, so as you get later in the season though, right, you have to bump up your rates. Does everybody know that? So you, you have to, as you get colder and you get later in the season, you need to be seeding higher rates. So I had a farmer that was seeding in Wapaton on November 30th last year and he was at 120 pounds. Now these guys are, you know, they like high rates, but he would go from maybe 60 normally, he doubled it by the time he got to the end of November. And I wish he would have just put it off till December because that would have sound way cooler, you know, seeding in December. But, but that's, that certainly is a possibility for us. But if you're going to corn, you're not gonna put rye after soybean because you either gotta figure out terminating it before you go to corn or uh, leaving skips or something. We'll talk about that a little bit later, yes. There was kind of a big soil health conference up in uh, Bismarck on the six, on the seventh and eighth of November, and I we ran into rain. wasn't going to be picking corn for the next three, four days anyway, so I ran up there. And when I got back, my drill was sitting there full of seed. Uh, Jamie um, Wilson, you know Jamie, Jeremy, yes, he was there, one of the speakers. He's a great guy. Um, Somebody asked him the same question there, and they said, how late can you plant it? And this is, he's at Jamestown. And he said, well, my drill is sitting in the shed, hooked up and full of seed right now, and any time I get a chance, that thing's going to be running. He'll put it out there on frozen ground, doesn't matter. Cereal rye in the fall, get it on the ground, it'll find some spot to germinate, and then it'll probably freeze, even if it's next spring, which is the vernalization process, and then it'll be able to come to full term again, you know. I planted the last of mine on the 16th of November. So, and that was into frozen ground. Doesn't it make you feel good when you go other places and people talk about how hard it is to use cover crops we're doing all these things up here? That's my favorite is, you know, when you're, in, when you're further south, there's so many opportunities to use these things, but we're figuring out how to do it in frozen ground with short growing seasons. So I think you, if you're using cover crops, you really should give yourself a lot of credit for making the system work because because really, if you can do it here, then people can do it anywhere. Um, so we'll get in now to what that rye looks like the following year and planting soybean. Anybody planting green with soybean? A few of you. Good experiences this year, not so good. Good experiences. It didn't grow. So. We've had good and bad experiences. Um, I've seen some farmers get hurt doing this practice um, by their soils drying out too much. I've seen farmers that if they didn't have it there, there's no way they would have gotten into that field. So, so the, the key to this, to using cereal rye and planting green, is monitor it. Make sure you're watching that field all the time because it's not, cover crops aren't the kind of thing that you just put out there and it's gonna solve all your problems. I, I feel like a lot of times we, we think that that's the case, but it's certainly, Monitor them like you would any other, any other crop in the field. Make sure that, that the stand is good, that you're, I mean, just, just watch it because it's important. This is on a high clay soil, it's raining, and we're seeding. Um, so this is, and look how clean that equipment is. That's my favorite part. I've helped farmers clean equipment out, and I, because I felt like I should, 
just to have the experience since I didn't grow up on a farm. Um, but this is really nice. This is a nice situation to be in where you're, you're seeding, the, the rye is cleaning the equipment, it's attached to the soil so it's not binding up and wrapping around on the equipment. It's a really good scenario. Uh, for moisture management, we talked about having three ways to move moisture, not only through transpiration, but down root channels, and then also a little bit of evaporation still. Here's, I've, I have this moisture meter in my pickup all the time. And so 50% moisture is saturated. So here we are in residue alone. This is all fields right next to each other. Actually, this first one is strips right next to each other. 50% moisture where there's just residue. And that's why we can't get in in the spring sometimes. That's why when farmers switch to no-till, I want to make sure they have a cover crop in there to help them do that transition. 22% moisture, same day, right next to each other, with having the rye there. So how important is that for making sure you get into the field? You're giving yourself a better chance to do it. You can always spray out the rye if it uses too much moisture. I mean, timing may be difficult because you're doing other things. But to have that there and to not have that residue just, just laying on the soil and not letting it breathe and not moving any moisture is really important. And then this is a field that, that was full tillage, um, zero. There was no moisture in there. So I, I like that. It gives you that medium kind of moisture condition in the field. Um, here's some soybean that were planted into cereal rye. Um, so we're measuring the height on it. We're seeing that our, our soybeans actually lengthen a little bit um, when growing under rye because they're, they're trying to get up to get the sunlight. Um, so maybe that's a good thing. I don't really know if it gets the pods further off the ground or not. I mean, I, I have no idea, but, but it's just kind of a, a nice thing to see. Weed count, oh my gosh. Weed control is amazing with rye. Anyone that's had that, you get a whole bunch of extra time on that field by having rye out there. So while you're spraying all your other fields or maybe you don't have rye on it, that rye is, is keeping those weeds smaller. So you can see on here that the, the weed count is the same but the weed biomass is 10 times lower where you have rye. Is, is it easier to kill a small or a big weed? Small weed, right? So using rye as a mode of action, in addition to your herbicide program, is gonna be a really nice tool for competing with some of those weeds. Um, I also have farmers that if they know they have areas that, that are just not productive, so say they're coming in, they've got rye on a field. For us, <clears throat> for us salinity is a big issue. Do you guys have salinity around here too? Or not as much? You're so lucky. Gosh, we lose a lot of productivity because of salts. Um, but on that field, so you have a, a field, you've got rye over the whole thing. Uh, you have some problem areas that you know you're not going to get really good production out of. Seed your soybean everywhere else in that field. Terminate the rye in that part of the field where you seed the soybean. And let the rye grow where you know you're not going to get any production to compete with weeds. Just let it go. You know, get your, take those acres out of your soybean production, out of your proven yield. Control the weeds in those areas if you know it's not going to produce anything. I think that's a, a good approach to save some money and to get some good weed control. And I'm not a weed scientist, so I just think that's an important mode of action. Uh, but here's side by side, we had these trips where we had rye, no rye, uh, replicated across multiple fields across North Dakota, no difference in yield. So I like that. I don't necessarily need to see with cover crops a boost in yield. I just need to see if there's no difference in yield. Right? I mean, sometimes we're not always looking for a yield increase. We're just looking that it's not going to hurt our yield. But it's giving us so, much other, so many other benefits. Um, so this is probably one of my largest projects in North Dakota. It's a quarter of land that we're, that we're doing conservation tillage practices on. We've got tiled on this part of the field. We have 80 acres tiled, 80 acres untiled. We have chisel plows, strip till of the coulter, strip till of the shank, vertical till, um, 100 acres of no-till on a high clay soil. I'm doing a lot of work out there. And we, that was the stuff we interseeded um, with our twin row unit. And then this is how it looked the next spring, uh, planting soybean into it. So really easy, it worked really great. Um, excellent weed control again, and decent stands. Um, sandy soils are a different, different animal um, because you're gonna wanna use lighter rates on sandy soils, right? You can't afford to lose a bunch of moisture on sands. So we went a lighter rate here, flowing on, uh, standing stalks, soybean into it. Um, this soil is pure sand. I mean, it's just, it's, I don't know why he doesn't just put his kids out there to play in the sandbox, but it's sand. Um, but this is how it looked on, on the left. We have the rye um, that was growing, and on the right is no rye. This field is conventional tillage. Traditionally, this is the first year, but I can see a change in structure already between those two. Can you guys see it? 
sometimes I think I'm just a soil nerd and I see things, but um, but it really, it, the, the, the fibrous roots of that rye are making amazing structure in sandy soils. It's probably not stable, but it's there, right? Versus the slabby kind of sands that you may get where you don't have something like that in it. Um, flying on cover crops in a soybean, okay, so you've got the cover crop on the front end of soybean. You've probably built up some nice residue. That will help you maybe in the end if you keep that residue a little bit, but most people find that all that rye residue gets decomposed and is gone by the fall. So now we've got to figure out how to get something on there to reduce erosion over winter after soybean. Low residue crops. So this is flying on 52 pounds of rye and some other things in there, some radish and some dwarf Essex rapeseed and some flax. Uh, but they fly on probably middle of August is when they go in, but the timing would be specific to your farm. So this is, remember, this is North Dakota. I'm not down here, so you'd figure out the timing for your farm. But look how nice that looks, and, and it helps with the, with the harvest process, too. Um, he talks about the push not being as bad. You guys know what that means? Because he kind of, farmers tell me things, and I just say, oh, okay, sure, you know, and, and I wait for him to talk about it again so I can kind of figure out the context and understand it. But I think it's the push of the residue was not so bad because of the green there kind of holding it in place, so he felt like it was a really easy harvest. Um, this is what they did this year. Again, flowing on that, that green is amazing. This is probably their best catch they've ever had. But this is on a quarter that has huge water management issues. They needed something in there to be able to get to harvest it. Um, so it looks outstanding. So let's see, so we've, we've gone in and we've actually seeded in soybean way too early. Had radish in there that were popping up over the top of the canopy. Um, and the rye that was hanging out underneath it was, was actually because of the shade died. So it's, I mean, it's so dark underneath that canopy in soybean. So, so you want to hit it, I think, I think, and I'm still learning on this too, is that you want to hit it at a time where the leaves are starting to turn and you know they're going to drop and kind of fall on top of that seed, but, but not any later than that because you may not get the benefit of having that cover crop there. But then if you're a nervous Nelly like I am, and I don't want to have something out there and worry about staining the beans and whatever else because it's not my crop, it's, a farm, it's somebody else's crop, I go a little bit later because I'm nervous. But that's where I think you start at a point where you feel like, like gosh, I don't know how you figure it out. But I think you, you start at a point where you feel like you're going to be okay, and then you push it earlier from there. And then you'll find where it's too early. <laughs> you know, Eventually you find where it doesn't work, and then you, you, you find that middle ground. <laughs> Um, researchers at the National Lag, Ag, Lab for Ag and the Environment in Ames, Iowa, it's an ARS lab, has done, did a lot of this interseeding work in soybeans, and they found it's best to drop it right at leaf yellow before the leaves start to drop. Leaves start to drop, you get the mulching effect. If you wait till after the leaves start to drop, then you're not getting that seed down to the soil. So it's kind of a, a fine time in there, and given the rains we've had, that's a little challenging. But they, they did that for a number of years. So it is at leaf drop, and again, if you have a good relationship with your pilot, you could probably get that, make that happen. Okay. Watch your neighbor's sandy soil, since you've got the good soil. Watch your neighbor's sandy spot, and as soon as that starts turning yellow, get out and spread. Because then yours will be turning in about a week and a half, and it'll be just fine. I'm concerned about it because I've seen multiple fields where they planted corn into rye and their corn is stunted, their corn is yellow, um, and I don't think they're getting the yield off of that that they, that they would hope for compared to the rest of the field. So most farmers, when they're trying that, well, the farmers I work with, they, leave, they do a strip and then they put their corn into it and they see how it looks compared to the rest of the field where they don't have rye. Um, some people just go all in right off the bat and then if you don't leave yourself a check strip, you don't know how that yield might have been hurt. So. Um, I'll show you some pictures later, too, where we have that, but I don't use rye before corn because in my neck of the woods, there's not enough time to spray it out before corn goes in the ground. Um, so we just don't, we just can't do it. And if I do use it before corn, I put rye in the low parts of the field where maybe I'm only covering, like I'll, I would seed it into the low parts of the field where maybe it's only 10 acres of the quarter and then I would, see, I would plant my corn into it. So you're not doing the whole field in rye, but you're getting the benefits of the rye on the low part of the field where you may take a yield hit anyways because it's too wet or your seeding depth wouldn't be quite right or something like that. But use it strategically then in parts of the field where you know you're gonna need it and not across the whole field. 
but you could always have rye out there and you could strip till into it. So this is, um, this field is going to sunflowers, but I think it could just as easily go to corn. Uh, there's that rye that was flowing on into soybean and they put strips in it, they got their fer fertility down, they're gonna put sunflower into it the next year. Um, and I think that could work really well, but I think too, something else to watch out for is if you have a late fall and you get a lot of growth by that rye, that fertility you just put down there and you have some rains might be taken up by the rye. So you gotta watch your fertility now. So it's tricky, right? There's nothing simple about using any of this stuff. But I do like the idea, and most, the other thing to ask is when people tell you that they plant corn into rye successfully, ask them about conditions. Ask them, did they strip till it? Ask them when they seeded it, did they leave gaps? Because a lot of these farmers that are doing some of this stuff and they're having success, they're, they're give, leaving skips on 30 inch row spacing and that's where they're planting their corn. They're not planting it into a dense stand of rye. So just watch out for that, or they strip till it, and then they have no competition. So make sure, that you're, make sure that you're asking all the questions about that system before you try it on your farm. Yeah, I think, so with the strip tiller, could you add cultures on the side and plant some rye, or do you, th I, I think there's tons of opportunity. Anytime you're making a pass over that field, I think we should be thinking about what else we could be doing at the same time. And if, is there a possibility to do two things at once? And so if it's an equipment modification, or something like that, and then figure out would that timing work right if you modify that piece of equipment. So I love the ideas that, you know, of, of trying different things to figure out how to get these cover crops down without making a specific pass for it. Okay, so this is, um, I flew on cover crops into soybean, and I did oats. I like oats a lot because I'm indecisive. So, <laughs> So I like that oats, if you fly them on or you seed them or something like that, you can go to wheat the next year because you can spray the oats out. You could go to corn the next year because it's gonna winter kill. So if you're not sure what you're going to, and then you, you could go back to soybean if you needed to. So I like that option of having to not have to make up my mind. So, but I flew on oats on this field. I did 40 pounds. I probably should have done more. Um, into soybean, end of August. So probably right before leaf drop or maybe a little earlier. Um, it's not a great stand. Um, I flew, I had the pilot fly it on like he'd be flying on cereal rye, but there's a weight difference, right, between oats and cereal rye. So would he, and I had strips, so he needed to make tighter passes when he flew it on. So that's the other thing, is to talk with the pilot, make sure they know what's in the mix so that they can get it on with a good cover, because we had strips, because I think he was flying it on, I don't know. I get it confused all the time, but he flew it on like he was flying on rye, and oats didn't fly on the same way rye would. So we had strips. But still, this field looks great, I think. We got into it no problem with wheat, and it was just fine. Um, other uses for cover crops in soybean, I really like this one. That's that guy that has that blue um, broadcast unit in Jamestown. So he goes in as soybean. He's got a lot of salinity issues or wet spots in his field. He goes in after he plants his beans, and he broadcasts rye in all those spots. He just, he just doesn't want to deal with them. He doesn't want to deal with the weed pressures. Um, he wants to manage those areas effectively, so he broadcasts and does a really nice job with that. So I like that idea of being creative and specific. Um, too early, this is really big screw up. Um, yeah, we went in too early. The, the radish got huge, the soybean were there. This is only on an acre, so I don't feel so bad, and this guy has cattle. But, <laughs> and he's nice. He, he, He's nice to me. So, um, but this is something you can go into early. And so then, so then if you're starting to fly things on into soybean, maybe don't put radish in there right away. Do something else that's gonna stay lower to the ground and not grow up like a radish would. Think about the things that you can adjust to make it so you have a little more comfort with it. Um, here's that corn into cereal rye. So you can see the strip of cereal rye right here versus the non-rye. And that's what makes me nervous. That's why I won't do it. As I've seen several fields like that where the corn is clearly held back by having that rye there at the same time. Yeah, so the, the comment is that, that in no-till, even you know, when you're using, with soybeans in there, they, they look terrible. Corn looks terrible. Everything looks, looks not as good as on a conventional field. And does it translate to yield? Um, I always think of soybeans are way more forgiving than corn, aren't they? So I feel like if corn looks like hell, it's gonna be terrible. You know, and, and I need to measure some of that, but, but I, I don't know, we're, we're just not, 
we're not funding that, they're, we're not getting that research funded right now because there's so many other things we need to look at, but I would, I would guess that they've done that work in Iowa, haven't they, and, and other places that tell us not to do these things. I know um, Allison Robertson at Iowa State is looking a lot at disease transfer between rye and corn. So if, it, if the competition doesn't get you, the disease transfer might or the pest transfers, or, I mean, there are just, there are too many things that add up between the allelopathy, the, the competition, the nitrogen tie-up. Um, Matt Rourke will tell you from Wisconsin that nitrogen tie-up is such a big deal with rye before corn. Um, the disease, the pest, there are too many things that I can count on my hand that would go, that could go wrong. Um, I bet you do. I get those calls, and I, I mean, of, of the 10, say I get 10 calls about doing corn into rye, eight or nine of them will be about how terrible it was and there will be one that says it was good. And I get call, I mean, I get a lot of calls, you get a lot of calls. Um, so that's why I would strip till into it. So here's strip till into that rye. They planted corn into this. I'm not sure how it turned out, but that's at least one option to get that rye away from the root of that corn and get it away from being competitive. That's a pretty thick stand of rye, I think. But say you, say you drop the rye rate down to 10 pounds of rye, Let's see, okay, so if you flew on rye and you mixed it with something like, like oats, you could do 10 pounds of rye, have a little bit there as a safety net for the next year, have the oats to give you some more cover, and then you could strip till into it, or you could figure out how to get into it without having a, as huge of an effect. Um, but I also like, on the flip side, you could put strips in it, or you could plug up gaps and, and create your own strips and then plant between them. And this is what a lot of farmers are doing because if they can get in after soybean and on these on high clay soils especially, they're too nervous and no-till to not leave rye out there to manage moisture. So here they, they plugged it up and they're doing strips and then they go between them. And I think that's a good compromise and you can kill, you can get your trafficability, get the corn established, kill out the rye and still I think have a decent crop. But those are things that we don't have the research on yet, but those are just ideas of things you could try or things that farmers are trying. But get the, get the whole story first. I mean, because, and also too, I think a lot about the corn into rye works in places like Pennsylvania and Maryland, but they've got like summer year round, don't they? I mean, I lived in Virginia. It's not cold, not cold. So, so they have a lot more forgiving environment than we do here. If we don't get it right, we're SOL, right? Um, not adding enough fertilizer. Oh my goodness, we're doing a ton of work on this right now through a USDA grant. And um, this is all Dave Franzen's work, so maybe if you go to something with Dave, that Dave's at this winter, you'll hear this. Um, but we, we have these plots where we have cover crop um, after wheat, so it wouldn't be, very, wouldn't be identical to your system, but cover crop after wheat that we let grow, and then it winter kills, and then we plant corn into that system the following year. And then Dave goes out and he does this thing with his 0, 40, 60, 80, 100, 200, whatever rates of fertilizer. And he looks at the nitrogen tie-up by that cover crop when it's released and how his fertilizer rates compensate for that. And he's seeing at least a 40-pound nitrogen yield drag um, in these systems. So your corn after cover crop is, is, is nitrogen limited in our system. So we need to either figure out killing our cover crops earlier or we need to over, add more fertilizer to make up for that. So just because you plant a cover crop there doesn't mean that nitrogen is going to be released the next year. We don't know when it's released. And in Wisconsin, Matt Rourke is finding the same thing. We don't know when that nitrogen gets released, so you better make sure that you fertilize enough, or if you're going to do a half rate or whatever, if you're going to knock 20 pounds off, do it on a field, but then go in at a full rate on a check strip. And if it looks bad compared to that check strip, then you better be in there side dressing because there's not enough nitrogen. So just some things that you can do to just watch out for. But that's what we're going to see is a lot of mistakes because cover crops are all rainbows and puppies, right? But they're not. So they need to be managed effectively, and, and you need to keep your eye on them. Um, but learning fast happens so much faster in a network. So, so I didn't grow up on a farm. I didn't have anything to do with agriculture until I moved to North Dakota six years ago. I worked on mine reclamation, coal mines, titanium mines, dredge sediments, um, abandoned mine lands, coal bed natural gas. And so when I moved to North Dakota, I had to learn everything from scratch because I didn't know anything. Um, and it happens faster with a network. So talking with research colleagues, farmers, consultants, doing all these things together, you're going to get so much farther ahead by really building some of these relationships with other people in this room than you are doing all this stuff on your own. So make sure that you're talking to each other um, and sharing that information because you can't do all this stuff on your farm 
all the time. So make sure that you're working with other people. Um, this is a network that we've built through um, our Cafe Talk program. So basically what happened is in, what year was that? 2013, a farmer came up to me at one of our big field days. We had 200 some people there. And he came up to me in the back and he stood next to me, he goes, you know, Ab, I'm not gonna learn anything at this field day. And I was like, ah, oh, dang it. You know, like I, this cost me a fortune to put on and whatever. And he goes, where I'm gonna learn is when I can talk to other farmers doing this, I can talk to you when I hear something and I remember and I think of a question a week from now, I wanna know I'm gonna see you again so I can ask you. And so that's how these cafe talks came up. I thought, well, why don't we make ourselves more available and help these farmers connect and build relationships? So this is what we've built. We've had, since 2014, we have 17 different places where we do these cafe talks. And so these farmers, let's see, so green on here are NDSU employees. I'm in the center because I'm the center of the universe. And let's see, red are consultants, blue are farmers. And all these people are attending our cafe talks. As their circles move towards the center, that means they're, they're more influential. They're the people that know a little bit more. They've come in contact with more people in this network. It means that this person could leave the network and it'll survive. I could leave the network, it'll survive. So our goal now is to bring all these people from the outside here, bring them in closer and get new people on the outside. So when you continue to talk with people that you meet at events like this or other extension events like Jolene was talking about, you're building yourselves a network and then you got people to call. So when stuff goes wrong or you have successes, you have somebody to call and share that information with. So Seed dealers should be part of that network. Equipment people should be part of that network. Extension, researchers, conservation districts, NRCS. Build yourself a network so you got somebody to go to. If you can't go to meetings, then join Twitter. This is a Twitter network. I love Twitter. But it's a great way to get information fast, but always look at that information and be skeptical. Okay, everything that's put on Twitter, you don't have a lot of words to say what you did. So if you see something and you wonder how that worked, ask a question. Keep your skeptical minds because we need, this is your business we're talking about. So you should always be asking questions and making sure you have the whole story. If you don't know what to ask, call somebody here, call somebody extension, find out what you should be asking to make sure these systems work for you.